A few years ago, Nathan Hodson noticed this big problem in the United Kingdom. Men are not coming forward to donate their sperm. Hodson is a doctor in the UK who researches mental health and fertility. Through his work, he noticed that sperm clinics across the country were facing a major drought. And these shortages were causing all kinds of problems. People, specifically single women and queer couples, were having to wait six months or even longer to build the families and lives they dreamed of. And when folks were able to get access to donor sperm, their options were limited. Hodson said all of this can take a huge emotional toll. So he and his colleagues started discussing how could the UK get more men to donate sperm? They looked to the story of Stephen Blood. Stephen Blood was a British man who was married, and when he was 30, he sadly got bacterial meningitis and went into a coma, and he went on to die. But while he was in the coma, before he died, his doctors, with the permission of his wife, removed sperm from him and froze it. At his meeting this afternoon, the HFEA decided to allow Mrs. Diane Blood to export her late husband's sperm to Belgium for her treatment. And after a legal battle, she was able to use that sperm in order to have IVF herself. And she's now got two children. Stephen Blood's story gave Hodson some inspiration. The UK doesn't have enough sperm donors. Maybe dead men could help fill the gap. We thought, well, this is unused unutilized well of sperm out there in men who have no use for it anymore. This idea has been around for a long time. Back in the mid-50s, when the first children were born from Dr. Jerome Sherman's sperm freezing method, the Cedar Rapids Gazette published a front-page article with the headline, Fatherhood After Death Has Now Been Proven Possible. Almost 70 years later, Hudson had a similar idea. And as we started looking into it, we thought, actually, there is a lot of strength to this. that has certain benefits, and it merits a really close look. Hudson and his colleague published an article about the ethics of this idea in a major British medical journal. Immediately, it got a pretty strong reaction. The biggest tabloid in the UK, The Sun talked about second coming and, you know, lots of people in the media kind of thought it was quite daft and funny and didn't necessarily take seriously the human side to it. Hudson thinks we should treat sperm donation kind of like organ donation. Don't know what it's like for you guys, but here in the UK, you can sign a little card, put little ticks next to the organs you want to give away. Lots of people will tick liver, heart, kidneys... And what if there was a box at the bottom to say, well, I'd like my sperm to be given away? In the UK, donors aren't paid. So university kids can't get their beer money by making a weekly trip to the cryobank. The country has also removed anonymity. Hodson said, since there's no immediate benefit to donating and your future offspring could track you down someday, these regulations might have contributed to the shortage in donor sperm. But if you've died as a precondition of the donation, then there's no chance of your future changing, which can change the calculus. He says there are other benefits to donating after death too. It's conceivable that this could be a positive reminder if you, after your untimely death to say, oh, well, actually something of him does live on in this new person who brought happiness to a family who really wanted to have a child. The policies that might have caused the shortage, removing anonymity and banning payments for donations, are exactly the kinds of regulations donor-conceived activists like Nick and Amber are calling for. But industry professionals who oppose these new rules say the UK is a cautionary tale. They're basically screaming, is that what you want? This barren, seedless hellscape? 
from Sony Music Entertainment and 3 Uncanny 4 Productions. This is Biohacked Family Secrets. I'm TJ Raphael. This time, countries around the world have been adopting the kinds of policies activists are demanding. But when the industry is regulated, who gets left out? There are absolutely examples of cases where discrimination is written into the law. That's next. Stay with us. When I first started talking to Amber about her experience with the fertility industry, she kept talking about all of these other countries that have banned anonymity and changed the rules around record keeping. We could pass a law today. It's been done in Canada. It's been done in the UK. It's been done in Australia. It's been done in Scandinavia. It's been done in all these places because they realize the ethical implications of it. And not only the ethical impl- implications, but like I said, the health ramifications of people actually dying. She told me this story about a woman in Australia, specifically in the state of Victoria, where Melbourne is. She said what happened to this one woman forced everyone, business, government, and private citizens, to reconsider how the fertility industry should work. I'd been given her phone number, but I was too shy or too nervous to call her. This is Lauren Burns. Back around 2006, she was in her early 20s, and she had just found out that she was donor-conceived. Like a lot of people like her, she was struggling to process this information. So Lauren had been talking to a counselor. That counselor said, I have someone you should meet. Another young donor-conceived person by the name of Narelle Gretsch. Even though Lauren was nervous to call her at first, the two eventually connected. Lauren remembers sitting at a coffee shop in Melbourne, nervously waiting to meet this stranger. And then, Narelle appeared. Just a really vivacious person, just someone that that dresses in really bright colors, you know, like reds, yellows. And she was just always, like, smiling and energetic and just a very kind of kind and compassionate person and she was so open as well like you know for me who was like the sort of repressed person that hadn't even been able to talk about it just to meet someone who really validated that what I felt was normal and that you know it was totally understandable and it was just such a a huge relief. After that first cup of coffee Lauren kept in touch with Narell. The two of them were on similar journeys They were both trying to track down their biological fathers. A few years later, through sheer hard work, Lauren succeeded. She found her bio dad and they became friendly. But Narelle wasn't having the same luck. It must have maybe seemed a little bit unfair that, um, you know, we were conceived at the same clinic, but she still hadn't got the answers that she was seeking. Those answers were in sealed records, locked in a government building. And that's because back then, the law in the state of Victoria was this. If you were a donor-conceived person born in 1998 or later, you could get info about your donor when you turned 18. But if you were born before 1998, like Norell was, you were basically out of luck. Your only option was to do what Lauren and Narelle did, launch your own personal investigation, which, of course, could take a long time. Narelle searched for years and kept hitting wall after wall. And then things got really difficult for her. I remember I got a phone call from a mutual friend of ours who was also donor conceived, and she called to tell me that Ral had been a admitted to hospital and that she'd started experiencing this unbearable abdominal pains and she'd gone to the emergency and when she presented there they had to do emergency surgery because her bowel had ruptured and what had caused that was a large tumour that they found. So it was diagnosed as stage four bowel cancer which is medically deemed like an incurable stage of of the cancer. 
When she received that diagnosis, the first thing her surgeon asked her was, do you have a family history of bowel cancer? Um, and she just burst into tears. Narelle was just 28 years old. She didn't know her donor or her family medical history. And her diagnosis came at a critical time. Along with Lauren and a bunch of other donor-conceived people, Narelle had been actively working to change the law in Victoria. Their group lobbied the state parliament to let all donor-conceived people, regardless of their birth year, have access to identifying information about their biological parents. In other words, that meant that even if a donor had been promised anonymity, this law would retroactively overrule that agreement. While she was going through chemo, Narelle showed up in person to testify before the state parliament. She told lawmakers... You know, it was wrong that she um, didn't know her medical history, that she had these eight half-siblings who may be in danger as well. The state's attorney general got involved and authorized the government to contact Norell's biological father. Norell met him in February 2013, but she died six weeks later at the age of 30. I'm really happy that she, like, they met before she left the planet. You know, that's what she really wanted. After she died, Narelle's struggle received a ton of attention in Australia. Suddenly, the stakes of donor anonymity were abundantly clear. For some donor-conceived people, not knowing their full medical history could become a life-and-death situation, just like Amber had told me. So, in 2016, Victoria's Parliament passed a law instating a retroactive end to anonymity, meaning no matter when you were born, you could find out the identity of your donor. The measure was dubbed Norell's Law. Norell's Law might have helped donor-conceived people, but some feared it may make a pre-existing problem a lot worse, a problem the Australian fertility industry had been grappling with for a while. But folks, there is a tragedy that's unfolding down under that even I can't ignore. Australia had been dealing with sperm shortages years before Norell's law came into effect. In 2010, things were so challenging for the industry that it made headlines in the United States, including on the Colbert Report. What happened, Australia? Did a dingo steal your baby batter? Australia had these shortages in part because it was already regulating sperm donation pretty heavily before Norell's law. So in the US, there's a marketplace for it, which in Australia you don't have. You're not allowed to to sell your sperm or your eggs. Hamish Hamilton is the COO of one of Australia's top fertility clinics. He's been in the industry for nearly 20 years. For the whole time I've been working in it, the shortage is always there. In the early 2000s, Australia banned payments for sperm and egg donors, something activists in the U.S. want to introduce in America. It has to be altruistic. There can't be a commercial buying of sperm. Nowadays in Australia, donors can only give over genetic material out of the goodness of their hearts. It has to be a true donation. So without payment, it was pretty difficult to recruit new donors even before Norell's law stripped away anonymity. Who wants to give up their genetic material for free, especially knowing that their offspring will be able to identify them in the future? It definitely creates a barrier for a lot of people that, um, why would I do all that? Yeah, it takes a special person to do it. But it's hard to chalk up Australia's sperm shortage to a single regulation like donor anonymity. And that's because there are a lot of factors at play. In most of Australia, there are limits on the number of families donors can give to. In the state of Victoria, where Norell's law passed, a donor can only share specimens with up to 10 women. And demand is up. 
Over the last 10 to 15 years, the fertility industry has gotten a huge surge of new customers. LGBTQ couples and single women were excluded from the industry by law and by custom until very recently. So in Australia, there's all this demand and not quite enough supply, a lot like in the UK. You would think Australia's fertility industry executives would be really ticked off by all of this, that they'd want to eliminate all these rules and restrictions to open up the market and create as many children as possible for as many families as possible. But Hamish Hamilton, the fertility clinic COO, well, he surprised me. In my time in working in in IVF and around this issue, it's very, very important to have that ability for a child to find out who their identifying information is. If that means that there's less donors, then that's just a decision that has to be made. It's incredibly interesting to talk with you because, especially as a person working in the industry, that, you know, that is a motivating factor because I think stateside here, at least anecdotally, I've heard the opposite. I understand why they're saying that because they they sit those doctors sit in front of couples who can't have a baby and they want to help them and that's 100% a very very important consideration in this overall decision it's just that you have to balance it against the future uh, impacts and I think in Australia we've had that conversation earlier that's all whenever you're making decisions in these in these matters you always go on the principle of what is in the best interest of the child. And that's the starting point. On its face, centering the best interests of the child, not the parents, aka clinic customers, sounds pretty easy to do. But in America, the argument that society should center the rights of the child has been somewhat abused in the recent past. And that's because this idea of protecting child rights It's the same justification given for anti-abortion laws. I shuddered this week when I read about the Supreme Court's draft opinion to overturn Roe v. Wade. And if we look at other places around the world, evidence shows that new rules around donor conception don't always benefit people equally. So you have lesbians in France or single women in France who were interested in using donor sperm and couldn't get it from the French sperm bank. That's next. Stay with us. Yeah, I can see. You look so nice. I put on just enough makeup to look good on Zoom. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Excellent. When I started wrestling with these big questions about regulations, I reached out to my friend, Alicia Eberhardt-Smith. I've known her since college, almost as long as I've known Amber. I called Alicia not just to chit-chat about her glam routine, though she did look stunning, but because of her experience in the field, she's worked at a New York City fertility clinic as a patient services coordinator. In that job, you get an overview of like every different process that someone might go through when they come to a fertility clinic. Donor sperm, donor egg cycles, egg freezing cycles, IVF, IUI, all the above. Alicia's worked with people who are desperate to have children. She's sat with them and understands their struggles and their pains. And she can really imagine what may happen on the ground if new regulations are brought into the baby business. Alicia agrees with Amber, Nick, and other activists that, yes, donor-conceived people should have access to health information. But that doesn't mean that they need to have, like, the name and address of their donor. She says there could be all kinds of problems if anonymity officially comes to an end. When Alicia hears calls for regulation, she wants people to see the bigger picture and be realistic about what could happen to the U.S. fertility industry. Even now, the playing field isn't equal. Some will feel the trickle-down effects more than others. Alicia points out that queer couples and single women who rely on sperm donors 
are already at a disadvantage when it comes to getting treatment. So they're not diagnosed with medical infertility and therefore are not getting the coverage for their treatment that a heterosexual couple would get. In America, insurance companies will typically only cover reproductive assistance if a couple has been trying for a year to conceive. But biologically, a single woman and many queer couples can't try for a year to get pregnant because they don't have sperm or eggs to conceive. So that means insurance companies won't cover their fertility treatments. This is something we dealt with all the time as a patient services coordinator, having to explain to lesbian couples why, yes, you have infertility coverage, you have IVF or IUI coverage in your insurance, but you are not eligible, even though it's the exact same treatment that a heterosexual couple would be receiving. In the United States, IVF is already expensive as hell. And Sean Tipton at the ASRM believes new regulations like ending anonymity or limiting live births, will create shortages of supply in America, which will make accessing donor sperm or eggs, sometimes referred to as donor gametes, even pricier. We have seen in other countries that when you limit choices, when you limit compensation for gamete donors, the availability of those gametes declines. That means patients who need those services are unable to get them, or they're much more difficult. So they face additional time hurdles, they face hassle hurdles, and often they face economic hurdles. Fertility treatments are already more expensive for queer couples or single women. And if there's scarcity because of the new rules, the system could wind up prioritizing heterosexual married couples like we see so often with adoption. Now, that's probably not going to be a codified policy, but... In general, in this country, you can bet that the priority is going to go to straight, married, affluent people. And so you're going to structurally impose some additional barriers to underrepresented communities. Uh, And they already have tremendous problems accessing these services. So I'm not sure why you'd want to exacerbate those problems. Alicia agrees with Sean. When she looks at the big picture, she sees the cost of new rules falling to people who are already behind the eight ball and yet most dependent on donor material. Are we placing kind of um, burdens on these people that we wouldn't be placing on other people? Because historically, laws around who can create families have disadvantaged queer families, people of color, people with disabilities. Like, those laws have been created to preserve, like, the nuclear white family (laughs) to the detriment of everyone else. For Alicia, this is all about equality in medicine. She wants activists to know, with new rules, we may wind up... Like, disproportionately affecting LGBTQ couples, single people. And those people are already more likely to be paying out of pocket for their fertility treatment. But I was curious to know how realistic this argument is. Was there any research, any case studies? that show that new regulation could hurt folks in the minority? I get very nervous when we think about sort of government regulation of reproduction um, of any sort because of the ways that that historically has been enormously abused. Renee Omeling is an associate professor of sociology at Yale University and author of the book Sex Cells. That's C-E-L-L-S. She spent a lot of time studying the business side of donor conception. I think people think, oh, regulation will make it better. But there are absolutely examples of cases where discrimination is written into the law in a way that is really problematic. One example she points to, France. So in the late 60s, early 70s, France uh, goes about organizing a sperm bank, and it was a national sperm bank. So it was run by the French government and French physicians. This national sperm bank had a lot of things donor-conceived activists want, and everything was very well regulated. 
but it doesn't mean that it was done in an equitable way. So, uh, for example, the men who were donors had to be married, and their wives had to consent. And then the only people allowed to use sperm from the French National Bank were heterosexual married couples. So you have lesbians in France or single women in France who were interested in using donor sperm and couldn't get it from the French sperm bank and had to go to other countries or import it from the United States. Those laws stayed in place until 2021. It's not hard to imagine a world where there is legalized discrimination against queer people or single women in the United States. We're already living it, with don't-say-gay bills and restrictive abortion laws. So I wondered, are Alicia, Sean, and Renee the canary in the coal mine that donor-conceived people are refusing to listen to? I asked Erin Jackson, the founder of We Are Donor Conceived and the Donor Conceived Council, what does the community think about new rules, even if they hurt already vulnerable people? I just feel like that question is a trap. Like, um, you know, if you're... If well, I mean, I, I've asked... I, I, I'm sorry that you feel like that. I, I'm not trying to... No, no, I'm not like, saying I'm not saying you're work. trying to trap me. I'm just saying, like, it's just, like, you know, creating a system that works for donor-conceived people will be a system that works for the parents of donor-conceived people. You know, our interests cannot be at conflict with our parents. And, and if they are, then something's wrong. I think that... Improving the system for donor-conceived people also improves the system for, you know, single mothers by choice and queer families. Like like I said before, I mean, if the choice is for same-sex couples to have a child that will have 200 siblings or a child that, you know, won't, <laughs> the, um, the answer is pretty obvious. Coming up, is it possible to find a happy medium between new regulations and a system that works for everyone? Decisions that are made about issues that some people might view as being unrelated can have a huge impact on this. That's next. Back in October, the ladies of one of my favorite daytime talk shows, The View, gathered around for a little chat. The sperm donors have been able to remain anonymous from even the children. But now the kids of donors are campaigning to change the rules so they can find out who their biological father is. So is changing the old rules a good idea? Icon, EGOT winner, and living legend Whoopi Goldberg had some concerns. People donate the sperm. I understand. Yeah. Anonymously. They do. Yeah. And they do that. And I think if you then say, well, you have to tell me everything about you, you're going to lose people no. doing it. Yeah, yeah. not everything will be. Is See, there a sperm shortage? Or there, no, there's, 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 there's a lot. There's never a sperm shortage. Like no. Never. No. Listen. There's no sperm shortage. No. Never. No. Never. Lot, That's one thing you don't have to worry there's about. There's a lot of sperm spillage. Not being able to find. I hate to say it, but Whoopi was wrong. As we've been hearing, countries all over the world are having sperm shortages. The UK, Australia, and other places, like Sweden, New Zealand, and even Canada. And that's due to a number of factors. New laws like ending anonymity and payments for donations, and bigger cultural differences. So. Here in the U.S., we're at an impasse. We're stuck between activists and other donor-conceived people who are calling for change. And the reality of what those changes could mean for both the industry and people who need fertility treatment the most. So I asked Yale's Renee Ameling, could there be a third way? One where we maintain supply, even with new rules? You know, I think right now, if it's sort of typically, you know, 
men in their early 20s who are in college and making, you know, a little bit of extra money and not really thinking too much about the long term, they might think differently if there was a requirement that they disclose their identity. And I think that it's possible that you would sort of get a different group of men in the door to be sperm donors. Maybe it would appeal to sort of new fathers, you know, men who had sort of had their lives changed by becoming fathers and wanting to share that. So is this the solution to increasing the pool of donors? Simply change the messaging to focus on helping people instead of getting paid? Francesca Sobondi of Cardiff University in the UK says it's not that simple. She studied altruistic donor recruitment campaigns in the United Kingdom and Australia. Which really stressed also the scarcity of sperm donors but found that sperm banks didn't cast a very wide net in their marketing campaigns. Instead, they targeted a very specific kind of donor. Ideas about gender come into play is when we see altruism sometimes being framed as a heroic quality or a savior-like trait. And when we're dealing with, you know, masculinity and depictions to do with sperm donor recruitment, I'd say some of the examples we came across wouldn't be out of place in a new millennium Abercrombie and Fitch catalogue, in that it was a lot of abs and there was, you know, relative absence of clothes. And there were, you know, lots of interesting things going on in terms of desire, idealised body image and whiteness as well. This kind of advertising excludes a huge swath of potential donors. Think about it. If people don't look like an Abercrombie model, which, let's be real, is probably most of us, then they may not even try to sign up. So this kind of advertising could be really limiting when it comes to combating donor shortages. And by the way, this type of recruitment messaging is really everywhere. Even here in the United States. Calling all men, American, working, human, health-built, strong, and loving families, all while earning up to $4,000 in a six-month period. Fairfax Cryobank has been helping people build happy families since 1986. This clearly targets a certain kind of guy. A guy who may be holding a fish or a lacrosse stick in his Facebook profile picture. But without payment, you got to get people on board somehow. And Zabande says this patriotic call to action appeals to a sense of duty. And? Ideas to do with nationalism, stoicism, and even sort of language associated with being a soldier, sort of the the militarization of things, um, was brought forward to imply that there was a duty um, (laughs) and, and to sort of frame donation, not only as something that could help somebody else, but something that the nation would view as as helping it. It's a strategy that sperm banks in the UK use as well. In the context of Britain, what we saw was messages that sometimes harked back to certain phrases, certain images that were associated to, um, you know, different war times, different campaigns, even propaganda. Spread your seed for Union Jack or for Uncle Sam. On its face, the appeal sounds admirable. Do your part by helping to literally build the nation in the face of a national public health crisis, aka a sperm shortage. But Sabandi says these kinds of campaigns have left out a lot of key groups. Decisions that are made about issues that some people might view as being unrelated can have a huge impact on this. So, you know, decisions that are made to do with gender, decisions that are made to do with sexuality, decisions that are made which make clear at different points in time who society or at least those in political power view as having what rights can really inform what we're dealing with right now. Plus, Sabande says that sperm donation advertising in the UK not only targets a specific kind of donor, but the messaging seems to speak to specific customers. The first thing that comes to mind again is how often the focus seems to be on heteronormative coupledom and cisgender, heterosexual people, and oftentimes they are white individuals. So I think that has been really a, a theme that's quite consistent. And that messaging doesn't line up with reality. 
Not all people who have assisted reproductive technology experiences are cisgender men or cisgender women. Nowadays, the people who use donor sperm the most are queer couples and single women. But they're not always centered in the advertising. Sabandi has analyzed hundreds of ads. And when looking at the big picture... To what extent might those campaigns be viewed as inadvertently exclusionary? Or to what extent might they actually be viewed as sort of reflective of potentially an outright discriminatory environment or just wider societal issues to do with race, to do with gender, to do with sexuality, and also to do with perceptions of family, who a family is, what a family involves, what family life is like for different people. This focus on whiteness, on the nuclear family, on heterosexuality, isn't unique to the UK. Renee Ameling again. I remember conversations around the height minimum, um, that there was one sperm bank that said, you know, we have this five foot eight height minimum that we set. And for Latino donors or Asian American donors, we have to relax that in order to have donors walk in the door. So it's just one of the many ways that when you create sort of requirements for who is considered to be a highly qualified donor of genetic material, um, it has consequences. In the United States, the donor pool is also shaped by sexuality. For decades, the FDA has banned men who have sex with men from donating their sperm. So where do we go from here? If the industry continues to focus its recruitment strategies on strong, white, straight men and nuclear families, are we just totally doomed? So the expansion of social media and the rising use of apps as part of assisted reproductive technology experiences is something that's really interesting to think about here. Whether it is, you know, the use of influencers or experiencing an online community, I think that's going to be so crucial and it is already so crucial to so much of what we see happening right now. It's not always just sperm banks that are doing the work of recruiting would-be donors. Next week on Biohacked Family Secrets... The underground market for sperm donors in the age of social media. We would strongly advise people not to use Facebook sperm, uh, Twitter sperm. I inseminate it in the back seat of my car. I'm like, listen, if you don't hear from me in 15 minutes, just send the police. <laughs> I'm like, listen. Biohacked Family Secrets is produced by 3 Uncanny 4 and Sony Music Entertainment. I'm your host, TJ Raphael. Our program is edited by Maureen McMurray. Our producers are Nick Mott, Jennifer Siegel, Shane McKeon, Krista Ripple, and Mara Silvers. Jenny Kim is our production manager, and Alicia Baitup composed the theme. Our fact checkers are Will Tavlin and Ava Ahmed Behi. This episode was mixed by Joanna Catcher at Nice Manners. Special thanks to Laura Mayer, Nuna Sharafadeen, Amy Eason, Jennifer Womack, and Allison Sherry. Have a question or comment about this week's show? Send me a tweet at TJ Raphael or email us at biohacked at 3 4com For 3 Uncanny 4 and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm TJ Raphael. <laughs>